So if you're someone in the United States or in any other country in this world who has the misfortune to have a heart attack, what happens to you depends a lot on where you happen to have that heart attack. In the city where I live, in Boston, your treatment can depend on which hospital the ambulance takes you to, which doctor happens to be on call that night, and what kind of insurance that you happen to have. You can see these kinds of practice variations everywhere you look. Practice variation varies from city to city, from state to state within the United States, and from country to country worldwide. Now, this isn't variation that's being caused by variations in the underlying burden of disease. If you control for the rates of heart attacks, and if you control for the rates of the health of the population, you'll still see this kind of practice variation. And because of that, researchers have identified this as the problem of unwarranted variation in medical practice. Variation in practice that doesn't make sense. Not that you can't explain it, but that, that ought not to exist. And so since the 1960s, and with increased attention since the 1990s, as the costs of healthcare have increased dramatically, researchers have really tried to get to the bottom of this question of unwarranted variation, to try to understand why is it that medical practice varies so much from place to place. And there are several broad styles of explanation that have been suggested to account for this kind of unwarranted variation. The one that's most intuitive to a lot of people is this question of financial conflict of interest. Now, different healthcare systems are set up differently, and they give providers incentives for different kind of healthcare. So in traditional fee-for-service healthcare in the United States, if you were a cardiac surgeon, every time you performed an operation, you would get a certain fee. You had a clear financial conflict of interest to do more procedures, because the more you did, the more you got paid. Now, if you were a cardiac surgeon working in England at the same time, and you were on a salary, there would have been no similar kind of financial conflict of interest. And in fact, if you were a physician working within the National Health Service, and your catchment area had a finite collection of healthcare resources, every patient in whom you performed an expensive surgery, like coronary artery bypass grafting, took money away from the pool that you could use to provide other kinds of treatments to other kinds of patients. And so there was a financial dis disincentive of sorts to use these kinds of procedures. And so it's clear that the financial structures of healthcare system and reimbursement clearly account for some of the variation that you see from place to place in medical practice. But they don't account for all of that. And what researchers have done to show this is they've looked at groups of patients who all have the same kind of insurance and who are all exposed to the same kind of financial systems within a healthcare system. As the United States, you can look at patients who have Medicare. So this is everyone over age 65. They all have government-based health insurance that reimburses doctors roughly, not exactly, in a roughly equivalent way. And if you look at variations in Medicare, you'll see huge geographic variations. The average Medicare spending per patient in the United States varies from as low as five to $7,000 per person per year in some parts of the country to as high as thirteen dollars to $15,000 per person per year in other parts of the country. 100% variation in cost, reflecting variations in practice within a pool of people who have the same insurance and same financial incentives. So the question is why? Well, economists have offered solutions. Some of economists have said this is a problem of supplier-induced demand. If you train doctors, if you train surgeons, they then do what they have been trained to do. So if you have one state that has 1,000 surgeons and one state that has 10 surgeons, there'll be more surgery in the state with 1,000 surgeons than there is in the state with 10 surgeons. And that's likely true. But again, that's not a full explanation. Psychologists have looked at this and said, well, there are a variety of psychological factors that figure into this. Some of it is the influence of local personalities. If you have a major academic medical center who has a charismatic chairman of surgery, who has trained generation after generation of residents to practice in that particular way, and those residents mostly end up working within a 50 mile radius of that medical center, then you will see an effect of that individual charismatic surgeon on the practice patterns in his area. Some of it is also peer pressure or local standards of care. If you practice one way and everyone else in your community is practicing another way, over time, it seems that people drift 
so they their practice patterns become more like that in their local community. People are affected by the situation in which they live. Patient preference might account for some of this. So if you live in an area for where, for whatever reason, patients who are averse to surgery, you might expect to find surgical rates to be lower than they are elsewhere. Sometimes that begs the question, well, why are patient preferences vary? And it's not like patient preferences come down from heaven or something. There are reasons why patients have preferences, and it usually has something to do with what they've been told by doctors or what their past experiences with healthcare are. But certainly patient preferences do vary from place to place. Some countries have cultures that are much more interested in aggressive intervention. Other countries uh, aren't so interested in that. And you can see that change in culture type or personality type uh, or patient preferences playing out in how medical treatment is done. And so when researchers have looked at this question of unwarranted variation, they found a wide range of factors. Uh, no single factor accounts for all of it. If you try to explain a high rate of procedure X in one city, there might be four or five factors that explain. If you try to explain the high rate of procedure Y in a different city, it'll likely be a different set of four or five factors that explain it. The causes of variation themselves vary in a way that presents an interesting puzzle for researchers, but a really complicated problem for policymakers. And so the question that has always come up is we know that the variation exists. We have very good knowledge of the types of things that cause variation. So what can we do to get rid of it? What can we do to ensure that the practice of medicine is on as rational and solid basis as possible? And it's really difficult. Because the practice, because the causes of practice variation vary, the policies will need to vary as well. There are some low-hanging fruit. If you get rid of fee-for-service, you get rid of a whole series of financial incentives. If you do very close monitoring of outcomes, you can identify people who are doing things that aren't providing high value care. If you educate patients better, you can likely standardize the kind of preferences that patients have that they bring with them into the clinics and the hospitals. There are many different things you can do. There's not gonna be one perfect solution, but over time, you should be able to chip away at this problem. Now, if you look at this at a global scale, the kinds of disparities that exist are even vaster. Uh, so you might say, well, rates of bypass surgery vary by a factor of two or three in different regions of the United States. They factor by a vary of six to 10 between different countries in North America and Europe. And they probably fact vary by a scale of 100 or even 1,000 on a global scale. Pick two countries, Germany and Mexico. They have very similar rates of coronary artery disease. The angioplasty rate in Germany is 100 times higher than it is in Mexico. It's not because of the burden of disease. The burden of disease is the same. There's something about the structure and the function of the healthcare systems in Germany and Mexico that make the procedure very common in Germany, very rare in Mexico. Trying to figure out the causes of this global variation are similar to trying to figure out the causes of more local variation. Everything is just on a bigger scale. And trying to figure out policy solutions is a much, much more difficult task because the scale, the size of the disparities, the number of people who are involved are much, much larger. Over the past 10 years, really motivated by the development of treatments for AIDS, there's been a real push to global health equity. The idea there has been if patients in the United States or Europe have access to highly effective antiretroviral therapy for AIDS, people in sub-Saharan Africa should have access to that same treatment. And there's a very strong moral logic behind that. Well, the question is, does that apply to every treatment that exists? There are huge disparities that are out there for every treatment that exists. If you're in Germany, if you're in England, if you're in the United States, you have much better access to treatment for cancer, for heart disease, for diabetes, than you do if you're in Mexico or Brazil or India or China, or even more so for the poorer countries worldwide. Should the rich countries in this world be making the same kind of commitment to global health equity for all treatments that they are for AIDS? From the moral point of view, the answer seems like an easy one. Well, of course you should. From a practical, practical point of view, it's a much, much more difficult question. So when you look at these huge disparities that exist between countries on a global scale, in terms of access to treatment for cancer or heart disease or the other leading causes of death, there are many different factors that contribute 
the one that gets the most attention is financial. Treatments for heart disease are expensive. Treatments for cancer are expensive. And many countries just don't have the national health care budgets that would cover this. That was initially a problem for AIDS. When AIDS treatment was $10,000 per person per year, it was very hard for countries in sub-Saharan Africa to manage funding that. Well, what happened? Two things happened. First, the cost of treatment had been dropped enormously. So now it's $100 per person per year. And wealthy donors, both individuals and national donors from the countries, decided that they would make a commitment to making this possible. Well, could something happen with the cancer or heart disease? Costs are malleable, but not entirely malleable. Uh, the motivation of donors, individuals, or government is going to vary, I think, depending on the disease and the social meanings of those disease. And then there's also a question of capacity. It's one thing to try to get medications into the hands of patients every day so they can take them. But if you want to provide people access to radiation therapy, well, that's complicated because you need to build machines and infrastructures, and they're likely to be built in cities. And then how, what do you do with countries that have majority rural populations? Or if you want to get people access to surgery, again, that's complicated because you need a, an elaborate hospital infrastructure, and you need a blood supply, and you need all sorts of in, uh, sutures and instruments and sterilizing equipment to make these things work. You know, different kinds of treatment are more or less complicated. And sometimes the problem isn't necessarily inside the healthcare system as outside the healthcare system. I was in India recently interviewing cardiologists and cardiac surgeons about the prospects for the future of aggressive cardiac treatment in India. Uh, now, India is a country that has more heart attack deaths than any other country in the world. Not the highest rate, but the highest total number of deaths. And very few people have access to advanced cardiac care. So I was talking to one of the cardiologists. He said, well, look, you know, we could open up an angioplasty center in every hospital in Mumbai or Delhi, but there's no ambulance service. If someone has a heart attack at home and they call an ambulance, there's a chance that they might get someone to come pick them up. But because of the traffic, it'll likely be an hour before the ambulance arrives at their house and another hour before they get to the hospital. If you want to make this thing work like it works in Boston, you would need to totally redo the urban infrastructure of major cities in India. And this is a problem in many countries worldwide. And so some of the challenges really do feel insurmountable. So going forward, for people who are interested either just in improving the health and access to health care of these populations worldwide, or for people who are interested in this higher ideal of global equity for health outcomes, we really need to do some seriously creative thinking to try to figure out not just these financial obstacles to health care, but the deeper structural barriers that will make it hard to allow every person on the planet to get the full potential benefit from health care. <laughs> <laughs>